Good morning and happy Sabbath. Good morning. morning. To all of our members here and those that are watching online, we just welcome you this morning to worship with us. I was looking online this morning and I just looking up some information and I saw that there are over 50 countries on this planet that Christianity coming together for worship is either illegal or you're persecuted for it. So I am so thankful to have the opportunity and the privilege of being able to come together to worship with you, all of you this morning. And I hope you all are blessed by today's service. Thank you for joining us. Good morning, CCC. That was a weak good morning. Good morning, CCC. Man, it looks so good to see y'all out there. It's been so long, at least for me it has. So I'm just grateful to be here and be part, part of this, this, this uh, worship service. I'm going to ask you to stand for our worship and invocation. If you could, please, with those who are able to. Let us pray. Father God in heaven, in the name of Jesus, we are so delighted, Lord, to be here in your presence this morning. Thank you for the sunshine, the blue skies. Thank you for the saints who have come out, for the saints who are online. Lord, it it is our prayer and request that you show up today, this morning. Let your presence be felt, that your people may be fortified and strengthened, so we may continue our work upon this earth. So we invite you in now, Father God, in the name of Jesus. In Christ's name we pray, amen and amen. Amen. Good morning, CCC. Happy Sabbath to everybody. Come let us worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Praise. 
time in our service where we have an opportunity to approach our God not only individually but corporate corporately I don't know how many of you um, have been impacted by what's happening in our country today but I was I was I had the opportunity to get a to, to, to get a very early glimpse of, of what they did to that brother in Memphis and I've been around a long time, but it seems to me that the forces of darkness in this world are trying to consume God's people. And as I watched those officers, it happened to be five brothers. As I watched them beat that brother, I couldn't, kept, I, I couldn't help but ask myself, where's the humanity in these men? Where's the humanity? Beloved, if there's ever a time for God's people to be present, to be vocal, and to be bold, that time is now. So those of you who are able to deal, I'm going to ask you to deal as we pray. Those who can't touch somebody, claim somebody beside you, so we may hear from our God in heaven. So let us pray. Father God in heaven, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we know that we are nothing, can be nothing without you. So, so God, we first thank you for your goodness, your grace, and your mercy. We thank you, dear God, that you woke us up this morning. We thank you, God, that we could put our feet on the floor. We thank you, Lord, that we have the strength to put our clothes on. There was clothes in our closet. And there was food in our pantry. There was a roof over our head. There was heat to keep us warm. There was family and church members who love us and who care about us. We thank you, dear God, that we live in a country where we can come and worship freely and boldly. 
Father God, we do not desire your presence. We, we do desire your presence. We do not earn your presence. We have not earned your presence. But we ask it in the name of Jesus. And we also are quick, Lord, to recognize that we ask for your forgiveness. We apologize to you, O oh God, because you deserve better from us. And Lord, we can do better and we must do better. But we first ask you in Jesus' name to forgive us of our sins. But then, God, we pivot. We pivot to, Lord, how do we become more like you in our character? More like you to how we speak. More like you to how we think. More like you to how we commit our resources to build your kingdom on this earth as it is in heaven. But Father God, we cannot do it by ourselves. We need you day and night. So let your spirit come down, fall down now on CCC, dear God. So we may hear a word from heaven. And whatever impediment Satan is trying to use to discourage your people, whether it is health, whether it is finances, whether it is spiritual battles, whether it is uncertainty, whether it is disappointment, whether it is discouragement, in the name of Jesus, rebuke him now. Rebuke his government, rebuke his evil angels, rebuke his strategy <clears throat> so that your people who are born and shaped in iniquity, but who desire to be like you, that we may stand tall and strong and confident in these last days. Father God, in the name of Jesus, come to our pastor right now. I have no idea what he's planning to say, Lord, but whatever it is, let it be, be, be imbued with the wisdom of heaven. So your people may be fed and may be encouraged and may be strengthened. This is our will, God. This is our require, our ask, and our desire. We ask it in the name of Jesus, not because we're worthy, <coughs> but because He is worthy. There's power in the name of our God. There's healing in the name of Jesus. There's salvation in that name. There's power in that name. Let that power fall upon us right now. In his name we pray. Amen. Does anybody love the name? 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 Does anybody love the name?
will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. I don't know who put the plants up, but they look beautiful. Thank you. Uh, thank you to the music musicians, the AV folk, and all of you who are here and all of you who are online. Before I begin, I would like to say that we need to be praying for the Tyree Nichols family. We need to pray for them. We need to pray for the city. And we need to pray that the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act of 2021 gets passed. It's one thing to pray about it, though. And it's another thing to be about it. So I would say one thing that we can do is communicate with our representatives locally, in the Congress, in the Senate, and let the White House know we expect some action on this. And I know I haven't been as active as I could be, so this week I will be writing letters. And I recommend you do the same thing. I'm going to make some calls. I'm going to write some letters. And they say one person can make a difference, so I'm going to be at least one of those one persons to try to make a difference. Another thing we need to do is demand that qualified immunity for police be revoked. Uh, it's train, well, I'm not going to go into my speech, but you can't train hate out of people. Sometimes you have to control their behavior. Uh, in order to get change. So be that as it may, I just want to say we believe in being involved in issues that affect our community. And so uh, we're going to do that. Let's pray before we begin. Lord, we ask that you would please speak to our hearts and that you would cause us to see clearly who Jesus is and who we can be through him. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I'm going to begin a mini-series today on my philosophy of Christian ministry. Now you might be asking why, Pastor, do we need to know your philosophy of Christian ministry. Well, leadership in ministry is not just a job for me. I'm very serious about ministry. Uh, it's what God called me to, and I think you need to know what I think about it, especially since you're considering whether or not I'm going to be your pastor. Uh, you need to know who you could be getting. Now, philosophy is a theory or an attitude held by a person or organization that acts as a guiding principle for behavior. So whatever your philosophy is, that's what guides your behavior. So I would say... To start with, Christian ministry begins with an understanding of the Word of God. Amen. Psalm 119, 105, your word is a lamp to guide my feet and a light to guide my path. I believe in sola scriptura. That means the Bible only as the rule of faith and practice. My creed is the Bible. It is nothing else. The final arbiter of truth for me is the Bible. Ellen White's writings are important, but you will not hear me quoting her very often because she's the lesser light that is to lead to the greater light. I'm going to give you one quote, though, because it's a theme quote in my philosophy of ministry, and you'll get that at the end. But I want you to understand, I believe Ellen White is, was in fact a prophet of God. I believe that. But I believe her writings must be judged by the Bible as opposed to the Bible being judged by her writings. 
So what is Christian ministry? Wikipedia defines Christian ministry as activity by Christians to spread or express their faith. We can find Jesus' definition of Christian ministry in two verses of scripture. It's in more, but in least these two, you can get a capsule of what Jesus says Christian ministry is. Matthew 28, 18 to 20, the Great Commission, we all know it. I use the New Living Translation of the Bible. Jesus came and told the disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, therefore, because I have all this authority, you go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you and be sure of this, I am with you always even to the end of the age. The second verse or, or um, scripture, it actually comes out of the New Testament and it's the book of Acts chapter one, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. What is this power that we will receive? It's, the Greek word is dunamis. It implies the ability to have or to have the capability with emphasis on function. In other words, you will receive the capability to be successful in your function when the Holy Ghost comes upon you. And you will witness you start at home and you spread out until it reaches the whole world. Now, my attitude as a pastor is I'm the pastor of the whole city of Columbus. Mm -hmm. Columbia. <laughs> Columbus. <laughs> Columbia. I am the pastor of the whole city. Now, there are churches all over Columbia, but I still, those people who are not members of those churches are members of my church when I get to them. <laughs> That's the way I see it. Uh, so we start at home, and I hope that our membership, those of us who are part of this church, will start at home and go into the neighborhood and go into the city, and we keep on going. Our influence is global now because we dare to stream. On the internet. So we have to have infrastructure to accommodate a global ministry. Just keep that in your mind. Christian ministry then, according to Jesus, is making disciples of Jesus Christ. Christian ministry is making disciples of Jesus Christ. This great commission is the fundamental mission of the Christian church. Making disciples of Jesus Christ. Doing good in the world is important. And it is great. And it is necessary. But simply doing good, no matter how good, is not the mission of the Christian church. To simply do good. Do good. But that's not the end of it. Amen. We must continue so that we are making disciples of Jesus Christ. Now, making disciples, according to the Great Commission, has three components that we must be aware of. Number one, making disciples, he says, go make disciples. Baptize. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So I intend to schedule baptisms every month. Whether we have anybody to go in the pool or not. So that it stays in our minds that one of the things we're supposed to be doing is baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Secondly, Jesus said... Teach these new disciples 
everything or all the commandments that I have given to you. So our ministry must include a way for people to learn everything Jesus commanded. And that doesn't happen overnight. It takes time. There must be a process. There must be a pattern. There must be something that we do with an intention of accomplishing, teaching all that Jesus commanded. And then third, we must do those two things and more in the power of the Holy Spirit who gives us the capability for the function of being God's witnesses. Who is a disciple of Jesus Christ? Since we're supposed to be making them, we ought to know what one is. <laughs> How do we know we've accomplished the task if we don't even know what a disciple is? So, I would lead you to John 8, 31 and 32. Jesus said to the people who believed in him, who believed in him, you are truly my disciples if you remain faithful to my teachings. And you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. I love that text. So the first thing is we must believe in him and remain faithful to his teachings. John 13, 35 says, Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. So loving one another is an evidence that we are disciples. John 15, 8 says, When you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples. This brings great glory to my father. So what's the fruit? Galatians 5, to 23, you know it. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. Now, as a disciple of Christ, we might come to Jesus with a terrible temper that people can cause you to strike off at any time. And we can start out saying, that's just me. That's all right when you come to Christ. But to be his disciple, you must let the Holy Spirit work in you to change that quick temper so that you are more patient. Because a disciple changes by the power of the Holy Spirit. We don't just say, that's just my personality. You need to accept it. If you are rude, you are not yet where you need to be as a disciple of Christ. And we don't need to tolerate your rudeness. Stop being rude, miss or Mr. Disciple. Let the Holy Ghost work in you. All right. Luke chapter 14 verses 26 and 27. If you want to be my disciple, you must by comparison hate everyone else. Your father and your mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even your own life. Otherwise, you cannot be my disciple. And if you do not carry your own cross and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. Hmm. Luke 24, 33. So you cannot become my disciple without giving up everything you own. Hmm. You want to be a disciple? <laughs> so a disciple remains faithful to Jesus' teachings. A disciple first believes in Jesus. And then remains faithful to his teachings, loves everybody, produces the fruit of the Holy Spirit, and puts their relationship with Jesus above everyone and everything. That's a disciple. Go make disciples of Jesus Christ. 
Jesus is our example. In John chapter 5, where Jesus healed the man in the pool of Bethesda on the Sabbath in violation of the rules of religion. <laughs> Jesus violated the rules of religion, but he never violated the principles of the gospel. And we should never get those things confused. You see, there were rules that man made up with the good intent of helping people keep the principles that Christ taught. But we are under no obligation to keep the rules where they come in conflict with the principles. So there he was, breaking the rules, healing on the Sabbath day. What a terrible thing. So in verse 16 and 17, so the Jewish leaders began harassing Jesus for breaking the Sabbath rules. But Jesus replied, my father is always working and so am I. And then they decided, uh, let's kill this dude. The next verse says we need to kill him. I'm going to skip over that and go to the 19th verse. So Jesus explained, I tell you the truth. The son can do nothing by himself. He does only what he sees the father doing. Whatever the father does, the son also does. For the father loves the son and shows him everything he is doing. In fact, the father will show him how to do even greater works than healing this man. Then you will truly be astonished. My point is we must imitate Jesus. John 14, 12 to 17, I tell you the truth. Anyone who believes in me, I love this, will do the same works I have done. Hmm? And even greater works because I am going to be with the Father. You can ask for anything in my name. And I will do it so that the Son can bring glory to the Father. Yes, ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. If you love me, obey my commandments and I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads into truth. The world cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him. And doesn't recognize him. But you know him because he lives with you now and later will be in you. This pericope or section of scripture teaches us that to imitate Jesus, we must first believe Jesus. Second, expect our ministry work to become greater in magnitude and impact. I pause. Jesus did great things. John says you couldn't even contain it all if the ocean were the ink and, the, the, you know, all of that, whatever that text says. Uh, you couldn't contain what Jesus did. He says you'll do greater or more, uh, uh, ma you'll have more magnitude and impact than I have. Why? Because I'm leaving you with a paracletos, the uh, Holy Spirit who stands beside you to prop you up and who gives you the capability to succeed in your function. You have everything you need, so we must learn to dream bigger. Amen. Let me give you an example. Amen. Feeding people who need food is a good work. And we ought to do it and keep doing it. Amen. Greater would be solve the food problem Amen. so people don't need us to do that work. Amen. Now, don't misunderstand what I'm saying because this church has a great feeding ministry. Amen. I am not speaking against it. I am promoting it. It needs to be done. Just like an a, a, a urgent care center. Uh, urgent care centers are always going to be needed because accidents happen. 
So it is possible to have the stop, stop gap of providing food while solving the problem that produces the reason that it's needed in the first place. Amen. It is possible to think past simply doing one thing and eliminate the need for it so we can find another problem to solve. Amen. Amen. What I'm saying is the power of God is greater than our minuscule thinking. And I'm not saying the ministry is minuscule, please. Don't misunderstand the point I'm trying to make. The point I'm trying to make is we can do far more than we can even ask or think to ask if we would dare to dream bigger. Because we've got the power of the Holy Spirit. Number four, we must love God. And the proof that we love God is that we keep his commandments. <laughs> We're in a relationship with God that causes us to follow what he has asked that we do. Fifth, Jesus himself will ask the Father for an advocate, the Holy Spirit, that will never leave us. It's important that the Holy Spirit never leave us. We've got the capability to succeed in our function, and that capability is ever renewed by the Holy Spirit that will never leave us. Six, we must recognize the gift of the Holy Spirit is the Christian's advantage. There are about five powers that are available to all people, but one power, the power of the Holy Spirit, is only available to the people who believe in Jesus. You didn't know that? Well, now you know it. The world cannot receive the Holy Spirit, the scripture says, because the world isn't looking for him and does not recognize him. It's what the scripture says. Christians who believe in Jesus know the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit is in us. Holy Spirit is our advocate and imbues us with the capability to succeed. So how do we know we have the Holy Spirit? Number one, ask for the Holy Spirit. Luke eleven thirteen 13 says, so if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Number one, you want the Holy Spirit, ask the father for the Holy Spirit and believe you'll receive him. Second, inspect your own life. Inspect your own life. Not other people's lives, your life, your own life. Galatians 5.22 talks about the fruit of the Spirit. Are you producing the fruit of the Spirit which you cannot produce by your own desires? I want to be more uh, kind, loving, peaceful, patient, uh, good, faithful, uh, 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 temperate. You can't make yourself do that. It's produced in you by the whole, I keep saying, it is God that works in you, both the willing to do his good pleasure. You can't produce by practice or willpower these fruit. Can't do it. Love. Can't produce it on your own. Most folk, I have discovered, don't even love themselves, so they can't love others. I would postulate <laughs> that you cannot love anyone more than you love yourself. If you don't love yourself, you can't love anybody. And the only way to love yourself is to get to know who you are as God made you to be. You are of inestimable value. You are unique, irreplaceable. There's never been a you. There'll never be another you. There's only one and that's it. Nobody can replace you and your place on this earth has been designed by God and he expects you to discover who you are and have your, if nobody else values you, you should value yourself. And the funny thing happens, when you value yourself, other people start to value you. Well, 
Second is, and I'm going to end with this, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 to 20. The, this means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. And all this is a gift from God and brought us back to him. Who brought us back to himself through Christ? And God has given us this task of reconciling people to him. New creature. Old past. Everything new. Now new creature. I've given you a task. To reconcile people back to God. Through Christ. For God was in Christ. Reconciling the world to himself. No longer counting people's sins against them. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ. Amen. When we plead, come back to God. As we review Jesus' ministry in scripture, we will find the words of Ellen G. White to be true. Now, this is a quote you're going to hear from me again and again. Because I believe this is how to do ministry. Christ's method alone will give true success in reaching the people. Amen. The Savior mingled with men as one who desired their good. He showed his sympathy for them, Amen. ministered to their needs, and won their confidence. Good works can get us that far. Amen. But there's one more step. Then he bade them, follow me. So to wrap it up, I express the underlying mission of everything Christian churches do this way. We, the church, are joining God in his work of reconciling the world to himself through his son, Jesus Christ. That's what we do. When Jesus began calling the disciples to himself, he said, Mark 1, 17, 18, come follow me. And I will show you how to fish for people. And they left their nets at once and followed. Mark 8, 34 to 37. Then calling the crowd to join his disciples, he said, If any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way. Hmm? Take up your cross. And follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. Now this text deserves its own sermon. Amen. But not today. Amen. If you try to hang on to your own life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for the, my sake and for the sake of the good news, or that is the gospel of Jesus Christ, you will save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? That ought to tell you what God thinks of you right there. He's telling there is nothing more valuable than you. Nothing more valuable than you. Mm. We need to embrace that. So here's my question. These first disciples made major shifts in their lives to follow Jesus. What do you need to change in your life to fully commit to joining God in his work of reconciling the world back to himself through his son, Jesus Christ? On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. 
But I love that old cross where the dearest and best of the world for lost sinners was slain. I'm telling you that my philosophy of Christian ministry begins with a knowledge that Christ has ordained us, once we've come to him, to be his ambassadors. Amen. What is our task? Our task is to beg people to come back to God through his son. Amen. And the reason that's so important is because he died to give us the opportunity to be reconciled back to his son. It's the blood he shed that covers me and the life he lived that makes me worthy to come boldly to the throne of grace to find grace and mercy to help in time of need. What I'm telling you is Christ did everything he needs to do so we can have, he says, John 10, 10, one of my favorite texts, I've come that you might have life more abundantly. That's King James. The original says, I've come so that you can have much more than all. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy too often, we're following the direction of the thief. Christ said, I died so I could come and tell you, look, I can give you a better life than you can plan for yourself. Right here, right now. And while you're enjoying this better life, I'm making you ready to live in a pure atmosphere where there is no sin, no sorrow, no death, no dying, no sickness, no, nothing that causes you problems down here right now. I'm doing that for you. It all happened because of the blood that was shed on Calvary's tree. Here's, I asked the question, what do you need to change in your life? You can't change it. All you can do is say, God, I surrender. And I will cooperate with your efforts to show me how to get out of this mess I've made for myself so I can enjoy that better life. You know, you know how it goes. Uh, God has planned a wonderful life for you, but one thing that's messing it up is sin. But he gave you Jesus who died for your sin. And now that you accept him into your life, you can enjoy that wonderful life that he planned for you. It's better than what you've planned for yourself. So I invite you to accept Jesus in your heart. Those of you who are online, there should be a link in the, in the description, either on Facebook or YouTube. You can click. If you want prayer, we'll pray for you. Just click, put your prayer request in there. We'll make sure that the prayer is had. And we're going to be in a process of making sure we can engage one with the other so that your needs can be met even though you may not be here or even in this country. We want to minister to you. Those of you who are here, we're going to plan a baptism. You may need to be in it. If you do, let us know before you leave. Just let somebody here know, listen, what do I need to do to get baptized? What do I need to do to find out how to join this church? You may need a church home where you know you can become better in this life with learning about how to follow the way that Jesus teaches so I can enjoy the best life possible right now and be ready for the life to come through eternity when Jesus returns. Just ask somebody and they'll direct you with what needs to happen next. I just want to tell you I love you. I'm glad you came today. I hope you come next week to get part two. <laughs> and then the next week to get part three. And then we'll be on another mini-series. <laughs> Father, I ask that your word would be sealed in the hearts of those who hear it. That we would make the decision. We want to join you in your work. 
of reconciling the world back to yourself through your son. All of us have different tasks, but we all want to be in the ministry of bringing people into the kingdom of God. So when you come, not only will we raise our hands and say, lo, this is our God. We have waited for him and he will save us. But we will also be able to bring a great multitude of people with us to enjoy eternity in your presence forevermore. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Verses 24 to 26, we read, There is that scattereth, and yet increaseth. And there is that withholdeth more than is meet, but it tendeth to poverty. The liberal soul shall be made fat, and he that watereth shall be watered also himself. What does liberality look like for you and for me? This is an individual matter and has everything to do with our relationship with God and our relationship to the resources of which he has made us stewards. My prayer is that we will consider this as we decide with the help of the Holy Spirit, long before we click that button for online giving or write that check or remove those bills from our wallets to place in the offering plate. Think on these things as offerings are brought forward this morning and placed in our basket. May the Lord answer your cry. May the name of the God of Jacob keep you safe from all harm. May he remember all your gifts and look favorably on your offerings. May he grant your heart's desires 
and make all your plans succeed. May the Lord answer all your prayers. Lord, grant this to all of us as we leave this place but remain in your presence today and always. Amen. Please be seated. I just want to echo what the pastor said, that we're so happy that, that you came and joined us today for worship, and we hope you're able to join us again next Sabbath. We want to again thank our musicians and our AV team for supporting our service today. And I'd like to ask any first-time visitors to stand at this time. Is there any? Okay. No first-time visitors. Any other visitors that I, I recognize some faces that have joined us again. So repeat visitors, please um, come again and we hope we can get you involved. Um, we are doing quite a few things here. So we need, I think you saw the slide, we need all areas. We need everyone to get involved so that we can enjoy our services together. Thank you again for worshiping and be blessed. Have a great Sabbath. Amen again. The Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace.